in psychiatric disorders that have been reliably linked with the clinical syndrome. So it is still something that has not happened. And, it, and the typical way it's done, and, and, and those of you who have read the various articles that have come out in the New York Times about various autism spectrum disorder genes has also seen this, that there is always some major discovery that where they found another genetic variant in another uh, important synaptic uh, formation gene, for example, that, and then they find that it is more highly uh, expressed in patient populations who have autism spectrum disorder or depression or anxiety, and then other groups can't replicate it. And this happens in Tourette's, it happens in other disorders. And, and, the, the reason, and there are many reasons for it. Um, I won't go through them, but I want, what I want, the take home message has, that I want you to get away is that what we've been trying to do at Cornell is try to use a strategy that's very different from what's been do being done in other groups, where basically they try to collect as many genetic variants and then try to probe them in as many clinical populations as possible and essentially make a statistical correlation. And this is not what usually happens in basic molecular neuroscience. We, we actually try to do a much more, not um, this type of, of bottom to top approach, but a much more integrated approach of trying to build upon each level of, of complexity and where you have a very complex gene and you have a very complex disorder. How do, you make, how do you straddle this gap? So one of the approaches, one of the take home messages I'll be talking to you to, today about is how on, on a story about BDNF, which may or may not be completely related to autism spectrum disorder, but you can sort of, this is the strategy that we hope the future will have for, all, for many psychiatric disorders and how we try to do it in collaboration with Barry, John Walkup, and BJ Casey. Um, and the second thing is, is, that, is that we, what has really been very enriching for me by being here at Cornell has been so the is what exactly what BJ just talked about and what Barry talked about that that as you if you look at uh, at genes across a, a developmental spectrum, they actually don't act the same way at different points in development, which is something that is sort of a, still a novel concept. Everyone thinks you need to find the, what has been previously found, for example, in other parts of medicine, a Huntington's gene, a cystic fibrosis gene, but what you actually are going to try to see is whether, especially when you look at common variants, something that might have adaptive functions in, in the early part of development, which will have deleterious effects later on in development, so that you can imagine that the confusion within the genetics field is that they, they have not taken this neurodevelopmental perspective. And that, and that what you'll see is that the strategies we've taken is that we are trying to understand something that's very complex. We don't think, we think we've gotten it, then, we, then it doesn't make sense. And then we sort of step back and look at, 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 at normal neurodevelopmental time courses and we, then it becomes a little clearer that we should have taken this in effect in terms of trying to understand this. And so this, this is more of a, of a proof of principle case study of how you study one genetic variant, but you can imagine that if, if, if it is done in a rational way, it could be done on multiple levels. Um, so the, the molecule that I'll be talking to you about is, as Gary said, is something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is a genetic variant in that leads to a change in the actual amino acid within the protein itself from a valine to methionine at position 66, therefore the name. And what we've done is instead of trying to do a study of trying to connect it to clinical disorders, we've actually gone and knocked it into a mouse and then did a, done a very traditional basic neuroscience approach of going from a bottom up approach of trying to find molecular phenotypes, neural phenotypes, <coughs> behavioral phenotypes, and you'll see trying to relate them ultimately back to the humans. We have no illusions that we are actually trying to model everything about this polymorphism, which is a human polymorphism in a mouse. But what we can do is we can come up with hypotheses, then I can go across the hall and talk to BJ, and then we can test these hypotheses in, in, in human populations, hopefully, and then go back and forth between. And that is sort of the strategy. Um, this is just a, a very basic uh, slide of what BDNF is. It's a very uh, large polypeptide. It has multiple effects on cell survival, uh, uh, electrical plasticity, um, and neuronal morphology. So it's, it seems to be a very, it's a, one of the major growth factors in the, in the brain, and it seems to serve multiple functions. What has not been so clear has been its relevance to human populations. It's the major growth factor in the brain, but, for, but until 2003, it was not known exactly whether or not there were any genetic alterations in this growth factor. And it, a group at NIH, um, Danny Weinberger and Bei Lu, actually found that in 2003 that if 
humans who have one copy of this polymorphism actually would lead to having memory deficit. So it seems like a very subtle phenotype. It seems to be a, a memory deficit and some alterations in hippocampal anatomy. And actually, it's as Barry mentioned, it's quite common. 30% of the people in this room actually have one copy of this polymorphism. And that what was very satisfying, unlike other genetic studies that have been polymorphism that have been studied, the phenotypes that, have, that were found in humans, such as this memory deficit and this 10% smaller hippocampus, actually have been replicated by other groups. So it seems to be that if you, it, it, this seems to have some impact, biological impact in humans, albeit subtle. Uh, but, and, we are, my, and they were also able to find a molecular mechanism. And my lab actually began working on figuring out that it's involved in the decreased secretion of BDNF. So it's essentially a, a loss of function mutation that leads to decreased availability of BDNF. What has not been so satisfying has been the fact that when you try to do traditional genetic association studies with neuropsychiatric disorders, including um, depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders, and, uh, and even autism spectrum disorders, there have been no reliable um, reproducibility of results. And again, there are multiple problems which we can discuss of why this is true. But, but the approach that my lab has taken has been to try to make a knock-in mouse, where we just knocked it into a mouse and to then try to just figure out what's going on. And this slide actually represents about six years of work. But the bottom line is that we've been able to replicate many aspects of what has been found in humans in actually the mouse. And that we've actually been able to figure out various regions in the hippocampus that seem to underlie this, this, these deficits deficits in memory and in deficits in the anatomy. But the whole point of making this mouse was not to try to find something that was already known in humans, but to try to push the system and find out things that were not that, uh, that, were that, not that obvious. And the one phenotype that we did find was anxiety related behavior. So uh, what we do in mice, in the mouse work, is that we actually do something that was not that obvious to do in, human, in humans. We actually put the mice into a conflict situation. We put them on a fairly mildly stressful <coughs> elevated plus maze. It's off the ground. They have a choice of being in an open arm or a closed arm. And then we do video tracking. And so you can actually see their, how far the mice moved. And they, as you can see, they spend more time in the closed, safer arms of this maze. But what you see is that they, they actually um, do spend some time in the open arm. If mice have two copies of the metallele, they actually do not spend time that much time in the open arm. So this is how we quantitate anxiety. We can actually get a, a, a numerical figure, um, num, uh, measure of the time spent in this open arm. But as John and BJ have mentioned, it's very difficult to study anxiety or to know the circuitry of it. And it actually, it was around this time, or it was like 2006 or so, that BJ and I were talking about this. And the question was that actually this might actually be due to the fact that, that the mice uh, might, just like with the way BJ has been thinking, might not be able to realize that previously dangerous cues are no longer dangerous. They might not be able to be able to calm down their fear centers in the same way. And so then we decided that we would look at this almost exact same circuitry that BJ was looking at in the mice.